I've done that, says my memory. I cannot have done that, says my pride, and remains adamant. At last, memory yields. Nietzsche. Welcome to the section on memory. I find Barbara Streisand's version of memories from the musical Cats is a perfect way to start this unit. In this section, we will discuss many aspects of memory as defined by psychologists and biologists. We'll talk about some of the problems with memory and some of the ways that we can improve our memories. Watch one or both of the videos below before getting started. Discovering Psychology series Remembering and Forgetting is a 28-minute video. The crash course in psychology video is less than 12 minutes long, and I find the older students enjoy the Discovering Psychology video while the younger students like the crash course videos. First of all, what is memory? Gosh, <laughs> we have no idea, truly. We can measure certain aspects of it, and we know how to improve it and how to damage it. We even know some of the brain parts associated with it, although we can name it, calling it an engram, and study it, we still have no idea how it works in the biological sense. We've traced the motor and sensory cortexes to the specific areas they control in the brain, but we can't isolate memories that way. It's a huge area of research. We know that people who lose their hippocampus through injury or disease can no longer create any new memories. They have what's called enterograde amnesia. We know that the hippocampus produces about 21 million neurons in a lifetime. Maybe they are responsible for 21 million things you know. Neurons in the brain appear to arrange themselves in 16 different dimensions, and that might have something to do with the biological aspect of memory. We know that learning something new in very primitive organisms immediately produces growth in the axon of a neuron in that creature, but predicting which neuron will be affected is still beyond our knowledge. Since we cannot yet define the micro level of memory, we must therefore drop back to look at memory from a more macro level. Any system in human, animal, or machine that encodes information, stores the information, and has some process for retrieving that information is considered a memory system. Unlike a computer, which has nearly perfect memory, the human memory, well, it's more like an outline. It's not a perfect representation of the facts. When we want to remember something, we pull up that outline. Each time we do that, we fill in the outline differently than the last time we pulled it up. We remember the event with all the rest of the information in our brain, both new and old, which leads to errors. We fill in the outline with new information which we didn't have previously, but we place that new information in the same time frame as the old memory. We believe the new information was part of the old memory. We do the same with older information. We think events that happened to us earlier in life actually happened during the time frame of the newer memory. We'll see in this section that our memories are not very good, certainly not perfect. The three memory processes are sensory memory, working memory, and long-term memory. Information flows from sensory memory into working memory and is then stored in long-term storage. There are some researchers who believe that information is placed in both sensory and working and long-term memory at the same time. But for now, we'll discuss memory as a flow from one process to another. Sensory memory preserves very brief impressions from all our sense organs. These impressions remain in sensory memory for a quarter of a second. There are up to 16 items per sense that are recorded, so you can have 16 brief sensory impressions through your eyes, 16 through your ears, 16 through your fingertips or body, your sensation of touch, through your nose, through your mouth. There are 16 items per sense, all of them together. 80 different impressions of our world are your sensory memories. There, that's a very large amount of information. It's a heck of a lot of data every quarter of a second. And since sensory memory only lasts for a quarter of a second, we need to analyze that data very rapidly and pull out the information that we need, the information that is most important to us. If this information did not leave our brain rapidly, we would be overwhelmed by the amount of data flowing into our brains. Autistic children may have trouble with sensations because they do not get rid of the information fast enough. Two major types of sensory 
memory are iconic and echoic memories. Iconic is easy to remember because it sounds like eyes and it is our brief memory senses from our vision. And everyone knows that echoes are what you hear and echoic memory is your brief sensory impressions from your ears. So iconic is visual and echoic is hearing. There is a special form of iconic memory. Most of the time our sensory memory is gone in a quarter of a second and hopefully we've pulled the information, the important data, into working memory to use or it's gone forever. Some people have what is called eidectic memory and this is the ability to immediately preserve or place visual sensory images into long-term memory, almost like bypassing working memory. The impressions seem to go directly from sensory memory right into long-term memory and it is very easily retrieved. Many of us would love to have eidectic memory. We also call it photographic memory, but those who have it report negative issues with that form of memory. People with photographic memory will tell you that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Imagine a cellophane sheet of paper. You can see through it. Now use a magic marker and write on that cellophane. Now take another piece of cellophane and write on it, and then another and another. Now hold up one page of cellophane and you can read it. Not an issue. It's easy to read. Now hold up all the pages together and try to read them. Now they're all jumbled together. And that's how people with photographic memory report what happens. This memory is a visual representation of what they've seen and it interferes or overlays over top of everything else that they are trying to see or remember. It is very rare to find an adult with photographic memory, but I had a boss who did. We worked in a computer center and there was an entire wall of documents to tell us what to do with these computers if anything ever broke. When something went wrong, he would tell me exactly what book to go to, where the book was on the shelf, and what page to turn to to find the answer. He never did tell me the answer, what the answer was, because he wanted me to look it up myself. That's the way we learn. We don't learn by somebody telling us the answers. We learn by looking those answers up ourselves. So he was training me and impressing me greatly with his ability to remember that kind of information. Interestingly, photographic memory and reading interfere with each other. Many children have eidectic memory before they learn to read. As they learn to read, their eidectic memory declines. And if we go to aboriginal tribes that do not read, we find a large number of adults with photographic memory. But when we try to teach them to read, their eidectic memory starts to fade. Now let's talk about working memory, which preserves the important recently perceived events from your sensory memory for about 20 seconds. When sensory memories that we want to work with are moved into working memory, the experience lasts for approximately 20 seconds, unless we are rehearsing, unless we are repeating that information over and over again. The working memory is also called short-term memory, or STM. Unfortunately, it has a total limit of five to nine items at one time, whereas sensory memory has 16 items per sense. The working memory can only hold a total of five to nine items. We call it seven plus or minus two. So here's one of the big issues, a problem with memory. Sensory memory is giving working memory access to at least 80 items every quarter of a second, but we can only take five to nine items of that information at a time. That's one of the roadblocks for memory. The link between working memory and sensory memory is a bottleneck. The bottleneck is working versus sensory memory. Here's a short video as an example of sensory memory interacting with working memory. Click the link and you will see a series of letters for about one second. One second is a long time. Try to hold your breath for a second. To the purging of information from sensory information every quarter of a second, you will be able to re record the information in sensory memory four times during this video. I want you to try and remember as many letters as you can, viewing it only for one second. Remember that sensory memory is fast, but only lasts a quarter of a second. So one second should give your brain plenty of time to view and review the material four times. Now don't write it down, just let the memori let, try to memorize it in one second. So here goes in this video. I will click this and give you one second to view this material. Now, how many items in that one second video can you recall? 
you move the sensory memory into working memory and most of you can start to write it down on a piece of paper or try to say the words as you write one letter another one is in your memory fading away you can't get all of them even though your memory supposedly can hold nine items the reasoning for this is that there's just too much information coming at us through our senses we might be able to remember that the picture viewed was a three by three square of items there were nine pieces of information in the video supposedly our visual system can pick up nine pieces of information easily we already learned that the sensory systems can pick up 16 at a time, which would be a 4x4 four four display. And when push comes to shove and we try to remember all 16, it's nearly impossible. It is difficult for us to do because we only have 20 seconds and then the working memory starts to fade. We have to keep the data in working memory while we try to access it and write the letters on a paper. And while we try to list the nine items, we run out of 20 seconds really fast. Think about it. If everything from your senses was placed into working memory where it remained for 20 seconds, we would have no room for all the sensory input because we're getting 80 items from sensory memory every quarter of a second and working memory only holds nine at the most. Sensory input is always changing. So if all that information ended up in working memory, everything would just get jumbled up and we'd be unable to function. We would have a nervous breakdown. And as I indicated earlier, this may be part of the issue of people described as autistic. Working memory is not letting go of the information fast enough, and too much information is flooding in from their sensory memory, and any new sensation is overwhelming. Sensory information is gone within a quarter of a second, and we have to determine in that quarter of a second what is important and move that information into working memory as fast as we can. Then we have to use that information in working memory as fast as we can because it's only there for about 20 seconds. If you click on the link again and see how you do with the second time around, hopefully you notice that you cannot remember all that information because we just can't hold a lot of information in our working memory and because it goes away so fast. And if that is the case, how do researchers know that we can remember 16 items, that we actually do have 16 items in our sensory memories? When we do this experiment, we do not ask the subjects to write down everything they can remember. Instead, we immediately ask the subject to name the letters in the right column, and they can. If we ask them to name the letters in the middle row, they can. We could ask them to name any four letters in any pattern in a 4x4 four four square. And they can, but after that, the memory of the rest of the letters is already fading. This is how we know that sensory memory acquires all 16 letters in a 4x4 four four grid, a 5x5 five five grid, and it's just too much. The structure of our short-term working memory can actually be broken into smaller units. We know this because people have damage to specific sections of their working memory. From this damage, we have learned that there are three specific aspects to working memory. One is the central executive, which directs our attention to specific items coming in from short-term memory. So we can pay attention to those things that are important to us. ADHD may be due to an immature central executive. There is a phonological loop, which attends our memory to specific sounds. And we also have a sketch pad, of short-term memory which stores images. There are two specific aspects of working memory for specific types of information, one for the echoic information coming in from hearing centers and one for iconic coming in from the visual centers. And that's why I told you earlier that echoic and iconic memories are so important to our memory systems. We have the phonological loop and the sketch pad because the working memory actually has specific parts that attend to that information. Here's a four minute video explaining a little about the central executive from a man who developed the idea, Alan Bradley. Go ahead and watch that and then continue on with this lecture. Working memory has a process known as acoustic encoding through our phonological loop, which is the conversion of information to sound patterns in working memory. It makes memorizing some information easier we like words that sound alike and we like songs. The singing group, the Beatles, traveled to Japan for a concert and they thought they would not be able to talk to their Japanese fans because 
they did not know how to speak Japanese. However, most of the people in the audience were singing along with them in English, and they were thrilled. When the concert was over, they went out to meet their fans and talk to them, but they couldn't. Because the audience didn't speak English, they memorized the sounds through acoustic encoding and reproduced those sounds, but the meaning of the words was never learned. I lived in Japan for three years as a child and learned some children's songs. I can still sing them today, but I have no idea what they actually mean. I have amused many a Japanese adult by singing the songs to them. They say my pronunciation is perfect. But it's funny to hear an adult singing a children's song, and it's even funnier that I can't tell them what the sounds mean, and even what sounds make up a single Japanese word. In American English, as opposed to British English, we have a saying, I before E except after C, or in sounding like A, as in neighbor or way. It rhymes, and acoustic encoding helps us to remember the poem. The saying is a heuristic, not an algorithm, because there are about a page worth of words that do not fit the rule, and we talk about heuristics and algorithms in the intelligence unit. Knowing this poem, we can correctly spell most words that have an I and an E together. If everything we have to learn in school was given to us in poetry or song, it would be much easier to learn. Unfortunately, this also gets in our way. Because when we are trying to remember certain words, the sounds of C, B, and D can get mixed up in our heads. The letters E and F are less likely to be mixed up, even though they look alike. This is because E and F sound different. Our phonological loop actually interferes with our memory processes for the letters C, B, and D because they sound alike. When we're trying to remember something that might start with a C, we have trouble and get stuck on a, le a word that starts with a D. When we think of the word starting with a D, when it actually starts with a C. The two letters C and D don't look alike, but they do sound alike. When my wife gets stuck like this, she just throws the alphabet at it. She starts with the letter A, thinking of all the possible A words that might fit then B, then C, until the word pops into her brain. Long-term memory stores material organized according to some personal meaning, so it's stored based on a subjective principle. It's also written as LTM, long-term memory. It appears to be unlimited in its capacity and its storage time. I know some of you think if I learn one more thing, I'm going to forget my name, but there appears to be no limit to long-term memory. However, there, are, there appears to be a transient version and a permanent version of long-term memory. There is material that you can remember for a couple of days, like maybe what you had for breakfast today. You remember it a lot longer than 20 seconds, so it's part of long-term system, but by tomorrow or the next day, you won't be able to remember it anymore. It's transient long-term memory because the pathway to the item is transient. The pathway disappears in a very short time, not the information. The items in long-term memory are permanent. They're stored forever. Memories that you may not have even thought of for years are still there. If somebody asks an old man about pets he had as a preschooler, it would be very difficult for him to remember anything about that time in his life. However, when we have brain surgery, it can be conducted with only a local anesthesia because the brain has no pain fibers in it. You may be given the choice to stay awake during the surgery, and if you so choose, then you get a local anesthetic on your scalp, but you are awake. The bone and brain have no pain fibers, so they do not need anesthesia to kill any pain in those areas, and surgeons can cut open the scalp skull without pain, and when the skull is open, they can touch the brain with a very small electrical charge. This is how they map the motor and sensory cortexes. A small electrical stimulation in the sensory area for the face will make you think somebody touched your face. A small electrical stimulation to the motor area associated with the finger will cause your finger to move. And since you are awake, you can tell the doctor what you feel or what moved. Well, a small electrical stimulation to another part of the brain, and you may remember things that you did not think of for 50 or 60 years, and yet, there they are. The old man remembers the cat he had as a preschooler, what she looked like, her name, and other information. The memory is still there. What was missing was the trace to it, the pathway to that memory engram. 
when the electrical charge is applied, it reactivates those traces or cre creates the pathways. So your memories are forever, excepting for brain damage. Your long-term permanent memories are forever, but the traces, the pathways, can dif disappear. The stronger the path and the more varied the path, the easier it is to remember a specific event. A surgeon can touch your brain area for a movement of the finger and your finger will move. The same location in almost every human brain on the planet will cause the finger to move. The same location in almost every human being will cause you to think someone touched your foot. However, memory is not as confined to a specific location. One patient will report a memory when their brain is stimulated in a specific area, while another person will not report any memory associated with that area. Memory is a diffuse system spread throughout the brain. Long-term memory has unlimited capacity, as I said before. It also has different subdivisions. And how we know this is because there are people who lose parts of their long-term memory and still have others intact. We can perform experiments with these people to determine the extent of their damage. First, let me define procedural memory. This is the division of long-term memory that stores memories for how things are done. It includes habits, for instance, the way you speak, your accent, may be a habit and part of your procedural memory. You don't have to think about it anymore. When you speak, the words just come out to you. If you learn to ride a bicycle but have not done so for a while, you can more easily pick it up and ride it today because it is part of your procedural memory. The way you eat, chew, and swallow are part of your procedures that you no longer think about. Procedural memory is extremely strong memory and is hard to destroy. It is the last memory to be destroyed in a person with Alzheimer's disease. Once an Alzheimer's patient forgets how to swallow, death will follow fairly quickly. Declarative memory is the division of long-term memory that stores very explicit information. It's also called fact memory. Declarative memory has two subdivisions, episodic memory and semantic memory. The semantic memory is memories of facts about your life. One fact for me is that I'm married. I know this as a fact of my life, that I, I know my name and my phone number. The semantic memory is a subdivision of the declarative memory that stores general knowledge, which also includes words, the meaning of those words, and also the meanings of concepts. Episodic memory is the part of declarative memory that stores memories for the episodes of your life. Just like an episode of your favorite television show, you can relate the events that have, that as they occur in your life, it is like your own movie theater in your mind. The memory of the actual events that you know occurred can be played out as an episode of your life. I can remember my wedding. In my head, I can see my wife standing at the door of the chapel, ready to walk down the aisle with her father. I can remember her father bending over to whisper something to her, and she laughed, and they started down the aisle as she giggled. I asked her later what her father whispered. She said, if you don't want to do this, I'll take you anywhere else you want to be right now. Of course, she went through it, and we've been married for over 20 years. The reason we know that there's a difference between episodic and semantic memories is because a person may be able to remember that they're married, but have absolutely no ability to bring up that episode in their life. It is the episode that gives flavor to our lives. Without the episode, who are we? The magnificence of who we are does not simply boil down to facts. Our episodes add beauty and zest to our lives. Episodic memory is the most fragile of the memory patterns. It is the first to be destroyed by Alzheimer's disease. Here's a picture for those who need the visual to remember something. Long-term memory is broken into parts, declarative memory and procedural memory. Procedural memory includes memories for motor skills, operant, and classical conditioning. The declarative memory is broken up into semantic and episodic memory, where semantic includes memories for language, facts, and general knowledge, and episodic includes memory for events of personal experiences in your life. It's time for a break, guys and gals. Go get a cup of coffee. Go do something other than study. Maybe play the hangman game. There is one crossword puzzle for the entire unit, but the hangman games are made for each slide. Take 15 minutes or so before you go to the next slide. Distributed learning is the best learning. We will continue the study of memory in the next lecture. Talk with you then.